uh, top of the hour. So uh, thanks for coming out today for our second uh, Climate People Environment Program seminar series of the uh, spring semester. And on this lovely warmest day of the year, uh, it's my pleasure to bring back a a local, or a UW grad at least, uh, Bill Kleindel, uh, who is currently a um, research faculty at Montana State University in uh, Land Resources and Environmental Sciences. Um, we're going to hear today a little bit about some work and kind of integrating some of the science we do with ecosystems and how that relates to kind of economics and being kind of nice way to think about those two fields together. And Bill's often my go-to guy for thinking about these types of questions, because I don't know. But uh, just for a way of background, Bill got his bachelor's degree here in the botany department at UW-Madison uh, back in the 1980s, and then went on to a master's degree in disturbance ecology in 1995, and got his doctorate uh, a little bit later on at, at the University of Montana in systems ecology. Um, through his career, he's been both an academic and a consultant working with public and private sectors on a whole variety of questions about ecosystem management, uh, including in aquatic environments and wetlands, and uh, we've been working on a project along with Paul Stoy on, on forests. And what we'll hear about today uh, is some work that uh, Joe's been thinking about and kind of uh, chat about on understanding the links of ecosystem structure, function, and economics in perspective of weapons. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. All right. Oh, man, this mic is so loud. Yeah. I hope it's off softly. I'm really used to yelling at, uh, across the big auditorium, so I'll try my best not to blow out the speakers. So are all you guys atmospheric, or, or is there other folks in here that are ecosystems, wetlands, all atmospheric? <laughs> cool. Cool. And we're going to talk about stuff that, that you don't know, might not know about, but that's fine. I only know about two of the three things up there, so, um, so, so I'm used to talking about things I don't know anything about. Um, there's somebody around. Right so uh, um, uh, let's get to it. So I had, as he said, I been, did consulting for a really long time and went back later and got my PhD and moved into the academy. And the reason I went back to, to, the, to academics is because I was being asked questions in consulting that I couldn't answer, right? And that maybe required more research. So some of those questions had to do with, with um, the complexities of a, of a rapidly changing world, as, as we're all aware of. But some of the questions that I did answer frequently had, were, had required constraints on them because of consulting because of regulatory oversight that academics have a really hard time answering. So it gets an opportunity to blend those two things. Mostly, I deal with systems that are pretty nice or pretty disturbed. These are both streams, believe it or not. Right? So this is, the, this is the channel. That's the low flow channel. That's the low flow channel. This is a floodplain right here. That's the floodplain. And then that's the buffer, and that's a buffer. Okay, so we have two different rivers. Um, and I like to think about it in terms of ecological structure that supports ecosystem function. So we want to think about in-stream habitat. This particular stream is going to have ripples and pools and cobble and shade and all sorts of things that make fish happy. And this stream will not have those things, but it still has in-stream habitat. It's just very deep hollow. So there's a suite of structural attributes that that make up this in-stream habitat. Those, those suites of structural attributes are kind of fixed. We want to see them in every river. These things exist in this river, but they might not, they might be, they might be a zero, it might be absent, okay? So the same thing for floodplain connectivity and this relationship between this suite of structures and how they interplay to support those functions. So that's a simplified version of ecosystem. So what my job as a consultant, you now my job as an academic, is to say how can we make some of those complexities of ecosystems translatable, the analysis of those ecosystems translatable to be a straightforward application for, for decision makers. These folks are not scientists, you know, or they have a limited, limited 
study in, in science, but they're really focused on how we're going to manage systems. So we have to translate the complexities for, for management. Um, so this is, so given those constraints, that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing we're trying to do, is how can we do that better? So this is the world that I live in. Right? This is where I do my research. Not like Wisconsin, it turns out. So this is Glacier National Park over here, and this is the Flathead River coming down, and this is all Glacier National Park on this side, and over here is uh, Flathead National Forest. Okay? And one thing, big driver is in, in a lot of the work I do has to do with, uh, would you mind if I take this mic off? Like, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, it's going to be easier for me to yell. Is that better? Can you guys hear me all right if I just talk in my normal volume? This is what scares people away from me at dinner parties. But, but so it's better for me. I can just like be more of a. Okay, so um, I really, the Clean Water Act drives a lot of what I do. Okay, and then its intention of this is to maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our nation's waters. That signed in 1972 by the best president ever, Richard Milhouse Nixon. Okay, I mean, he may have had some troubles, and he may have been trying to keep our attention away from Vietnam, but he did sign in the, the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act and NEPA and EPA and the biggest movement of environmental work that was done in the United States. And specifically, this act had a open-ended component to it that allowed innovation to occur to try to fill in the language that they were asking. Like, what is integrity, for instance? And that, that, that idea continued, like, all the way in the 1990 when there was a and a memorandum of agreement between, by the, initiated by the president between Army Corps and EPA that there'll be no net loss of, ecos of wetlands functions and values, okay, 1990. At that time, nobody knew what wetland functions were, right? And nobody knew what wetland values were. So a lot of work started, started moving forward on, on this idea of functions. This relationship between structure and functions, which I brief briefly introduced, was something that had been thought about all the way back into the 60s by a guy named, well, a pair of brothers named Odom, who said, there's a suite of functions, they interact to, a suite of attributes that interact to support function, and that's how conceptually we can do it. So following this, a lot of this work was done to get towards how to address wetland function. Now this is how much that term wetland function showed up in the literature, sort of the zeitgeist of, since these initial components of the Clean Water Act in 1972, 1977 Order of Protection for Wetlands by Carter, um, uh, George Bush, the, George Bush the Greater came up with this particular one, which was supported by by Clinton and George Bush the Lesser um, and Obama, and then 1995 there was an adaption of, of a, a functional assessment approach to, to help support this thing and then the compensatory mitigation rule. And this is how many times wetland functions showed up in the literature by year um, based on the 177 million publication search or keyword search, okay? So you can see it's rising up, like people are paying attention to it in the, in, in the sciences. Um, so how do, we, how do we measure that and implement that in a straightforward way that helps management? So, one thing that we can look at is that we've got a disturbance gradient. We can go look at sites that are really disturbed and sites that are not very disturbed. And then we can look at how the structural attributes respond to that disturbance gradient. So because all you guys are atmospheric people and you don't really think about wetlands, you probably think about birds, right? <laughs> what a bird looks like. So let's say this is chickadees, right? So chickadees are really tolerant to disturbance until you get very, very, very urban. And then it's only crows and pigeons. So the chickadee numbers drop way down. While the, while the, the rufous hummingbird does not like any urban at all, it's gonna disappear right away. But, but crows, or percent of crows, or percent of pigeons might be really low until it gets very urban and rises up. So you see there's a response to a gradient of disturbance. Is anybody confused on that? And because I'm going to talk right up to 9.59 and 30 seconds, guaranteed. So if you have any questions, stop me in the middle of this. But that makes sense, right? So we can do the same sort of response to the ecological structure. Thinking about this side up here, the macrotopographic complexity, or the tree density, or the frequency of surface flooding, 
they're all going to have some kind of response. And if they don't have a response, then we're not going to use that as a metric. Okay? Um, so each one of those structural elements that have a response, we can provide a, a condition score and combine those in different ways to get to this thing. Now, why would we go through this kind of simplified code? Oh, wait, get ahead of myself. So, so given that, I have been involved in making these kind of rapid assessment tools to help with this management thing for a long time. And it's, these are pretty common, like floodplain functions. Surface water and groundwater storage and flow, nutrient cycling, retention of organics, export of organic carbon. I can develop a, a multi-metric index that measures that in a rapid way and I can look at this wetland and apply that sort of attribute scoring to the relationship of disturbance. This wetland, compared to a big gradient of wetlands from good to bad, falls into this sort of categories on my multi-metric scores. It's not doing very good for, for vertebrate habitat. It's doing pretty good for floodplain and dispersion. A score of one is the best score. And this is kind of the range. It's probably doing bad with vertebrate, vertebrate habitat because there's a road in the buffer area or something along those lines. Does that make sense? You guys follow me so far? I haven't lost anybody? Why am I doing it in a rap? Why don't I just go measure stuff? Because I'm limited by time. Okay? I can't, I have to go out and help somebody get a permit. EPA needs and Army Corps need the information so they can make decisions to give or deny the permit. So they divided these assessment tools into three major categories. They divided it into a tier one, which is a map-based status and trends. Is it there or not there based on maps? The, the, the second tier is this rapid assessment protocol, which, which we'll get to in a second. The third one is intensive site monitoring. So you guys are atmospheric people. You're used to collecting a ton of data and analyzing all that data. It takes time. Right? It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of money. So if I want to know how much carbon petritons are being sequestered on my wetland, and whether that's important or not, that's going to take me a lot of time and a lot of monitoring and a lot of dollars. The, the permit decision turnaround has to be rapid. It can't spend that much time and money, unless it's very contentious, unless it's something like Pebble Mine or, you know, or a big pipeline that's, that, that gets into lawsuits. Most of them are rapid, which doesn't actually measure carbon sequestration. It measures the capacity of the system to perform carbon sequestration. And it measure that by, does it have wood? Does it have organics in the soil? That sort of thing. So just the capacity, not the actual thing. Yes? Then they, uh, is this a tool that the entire state of Montana uses? This is a tool that the entire country uses. OK. But they're regional. They're bioregional. Yeah. And there's lots of problems about agreements and vetting and political capital will make them all work. So there's various qualities of those things out there. There's over 600 of them in the United States. It's a big junk show. There's six in Montana, about 35 of them around Montana because of disagreements of their applications. But, um, but it is a very common approach. It's like the most common. It's, in fact, it's codified that you have to do rapid assessment first, unless you get into courts, then you're going to go to the tier three. So status and trends is tier one stuff. All right, so let's get to values, right? No net loss of functions and values. So here's the same keyword search for values, and it's kind of language. It's not really taken off like functions have. A lot of work has been done with functions. Values is like nobody knows what it means, right? So uh, values it was a really hard time uh, quantifying them until this concept of ecosystem services showed up. You probably heard of it. It's kind of a buzzword now. Okay? So this, this is a great paper, The History of Ecosystem Services and Economic Theory and Practice and blah, 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 blah. I give you all these references if you want them. Um, but they've said, OK, well, this ecosystem services term showed up in the 60s, mostly and through the 90s, mostly as a conservation tool. Right? This stuff is important. It's worth a billion dollars. And if you fill it, you are going to lose that opportunity of taking advantage of this free thing worth a billion dollars, right? And uh, 
right when um, Gonzaga, not up on this author line, when he said it was worth a billion dollars or whatever number he gave, the economists and the marketing people were like, wait, what? What, something's worth money that I'm not selling? Wait a minute, hold the phone. So then they're like, okay, how can we figure out the marketable value so I can create a commodity? And then how can I link providers to end users in that commodity and start selling carbon credits and all those other things? So that's where that came from. Is this idea of services of ecosystems are important, they're worth a bunch of money, let's start selling them, right? And then the economists kind of took off with this idea of ecosystem services, defined as the goods and benefits obtained from ecosystems that maintain human well-being, okay? Functions happen, just, they don't care about, functions don't care about humans, okay? Carbon sequestration will happen whether there's people there or not. The value of selling carbon credits is very beneficiary focused, very human based, okay? So that's the distinction between the two words, although they're often conflated. So, here's those same, those same, uh, uh, flex points of, of legal components, but also the millennial assessment came out in 2005 and introduced the term ecosystem services to a broader audience. And the ecosystem service shows up in this compensatory mitigation, which means if you fill a wetland under the Clean Water Act Section 404, you've got to com make compensatory uh, fix that wetland bill. No net loss functions and values, well, they're okay with replacing services for that. But here's this term services just shot up. And it's surpassed in the literature, surpassed weapon function, weapon services have gone up. And the two things are conflated, and that conflation can lead to problems, which we'll talk about in a second. So, the <coughs> millennial, sorry, <coughs> not COVID, not COVID. Um, the, the, the millennial assessment came out in 2005 and said, okay, these ecosystem services that maintain human well being fall into four big categories. Supporting, which is what ecosystems do. Provisioning, which is like raw materials, food and fiber. Regulating, which is water quality and quantity. And uh, cultural, which is aesthetic and education, those sort of things. And then this fellow Boyd came out a, year, a couple years later and said, wait, 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 don't give these things. Supporting is what ecosystems do. So we're not gonna call those a final big services which benefit humans. This is an intermediate service because they love adding new words on and making it this already fairly complicated uh, literature into more complicated by poorly defined words, <laughs> which is the, it's, it's all over there. But let's use an example. Let's look at this young woman here. She's out fishing. What does she need to go fly fishing? She needs fish, right? We're not gonna fish unless there's fish in. She needs an opportunity to access those fish. And then from that, she's gonna buy a fishing license, and a fish gear, and she's gonna have a great day, okay? So those are the elements that make, that make the ecosystem service flow. So it starts with fish density, which is what the ecosystem is gonna do. It's gonna make habitat that allows fish to be in large enough numbers to attract a fisherman. And then there has to be access to that fishing. From that, they're gonna make that final service of recreational fishing, but it doesn't stop there because recreational fishing itself is a natural capital. It's a thing that's gonna go across a production boundary. And the production boundary is gonna engage with human capital to make things like fly rods and hotels and restaurants. And those things have value. And you can determine those values by saying, how much would you be willing to pay for the fish that allow for this hotel to happen? And then from that, you can give a dollar value to it. Okay. Um, it also crosses a cultural capital, and then you get a benefit. I just love fishing. Okay, and those those benefits have intrinsic value, which requires some other types of modeling that aren't direct survey-based approaches to get to monetary value. It becomes complicated when you get dollar values out of services. Arguably, that's like a tier three approach. But because humans are awful. We want more of this thing and we'll, we'll wring it out. We'll fish so there's no more fish left. And that creates cumulative pressures and those cumulative pressures require policy or incentives to either limit stream opportunity to go fishing or increase fish density through restoration. And this whole circle is an ecosystem service flow model. 
Because with me or against me. Okay. So this is the simplified version, if it's, if it's possible, of the social ecological system that this sort of operates in. Policy and management can shape landscapes by shaping the structure of those landscapes. It shapes the function of those landscapes. Those, those functions create products, sink and source products. Let's say carbon sequestration is a sink product. Organic carbon export is a source product. Some, some of those products benefit humans on our final ecosystem services. This point, part in here is how do we monitor and how do we transfer information of the quality of the system or the quality of the service so we can direct policy. Mostly to get to this idea of translatable for management applications, which arguably, I would say all of us, even the complexities of atmospheric science should be thinking about, right? How do we get this into a translatable component? Um, so here we are. There's our example of our wetland. Here's the example of the, of the functions that are there and the quality of the functions given what this wetland has in terms of its structure. And ideally, we should be able to make the same sort of model or the same sort of rapid model to get to ecosystem services. So here's a list of ecosystem services that I made up. But really, what are they? Like, you don't want me making up stuff because I'm not, I'm not good at it. Well, I'm really good at making up stuff, believe me, but I'm not good at if those things are actual real, the important things are not. The, the list of functions that I came up with came out of the literature that has been building since the since the 60s and in, 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 in the 70s in wetland ecology, but nobody's really thought about the service thing. So what, it, what are the floodplain services? So in recent work, we went uh, and developed a, something called a Delphi survey, where we went out and asked uh, aquatic managers all over the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Northwest and said, what ecosystem services are important to you? And we started by going to some of these guidance documents Specifically, this one here is this a website that we can <laughs> add in what spatial environments we're interested in, terrestrial or aquatic, what uh, relevant biophysical components are in it, such as soil, water, and flora, who is the beneficiaries, loggers and miners, and everybody else. And then it pumps out a list of 204 uh, potential ecosystem services of floodplains. Everything from carbon sequestration to the rustling of leaves, right? So some people dig the rustling of leaves, it's on the list. I don't know if that's important or not, so we sent those 204 out to a survey. Fortunately, there was a lot of repeats, we managed to get it down to about 51. But we sent out these 51, 60 um, potential services to our experts, and they fell into 17 cultural ones that are important for cultural components, provisioning and regulating, they split up that way. And then we asked them, um, we were looking ideally for a top 10 list from, from these 51. So the experts, the way Delphi surveys work is after each round of the survey, we summarize what other people said and we send back uh, the questions back to the experts and we say, here's the answer you gave us, here's what everybody else said, now give us another, give it to us again. Let's try to give it to sort of a group think approach. Um, leading towards consensus. And we this is the Northern Rockies, Pacific Northwest, a bunch of conservation groups and SWS and sort of thing, Society of Wealth and Scientists. Asking questions like the following uh, either cultural provisioning, regulating one of those 51 services uh, are important to how you manage your, make your aquatic land management decision. Not important, but very important is Ligard scale. And then, then we analyzed that and said, okay, one through five was our list. We said anything above 3.75 we would consider. And that, that cut, the, um, cut our uh, 50 down to 33. And you can see that the cultural ones are pretty important. The provisioning ones, they got rid of a bunch of them, and the, but the regulating ones, they kept them all. So water quality, toxin removal, those sort of things were really important, were the most important. On the second round, we had 179 in the first round, 56 in the second round. And believe me, we asked about 2,000 people and 179 responded. 
according to the social scientists, 179 is a, is a great number. And then I said, what about 56? And they said, that's awesome. And they think about 30. We asked like thousands of people and 30 was the number we're shooting for because that's what social scientists, like that's, I mean, there's hard science and there's difficult science. I don't know if you've heard that one, but social science is a difficult science, believe me. Anyway, we broke this down. So the top 10 in those big groups, and this is the next 11 to 20. So really regulating was important, like water quality, water quantity, those sort of things. Provisioning in terms of hunting and fishing were sort of less important than cultural components like rustling of leaves, sorry, didn't make the final list. But here's our final top 10 list for, for ecosystem services. And I'm just gonna skip. You see general, carbon sequestration was actually lower than I thought. I thought it would be like number three or something, but drinking water, flood control, habitat, toxins, landscape integrity, and stuff I think that. Okay, so now we've got a list of, of, of uh, we have this flow model that we're, we're getting towards, the fish, fish density, and the opportunity leads to recreational fishing. We have tools already built, like you asked the question. We have tools, existing rapid assessment function models that can get to this thing, but we want to add in another components that we can easily assess, like, like cadastral data or spatial data or distance from beneficiary use to get to some measurements of opportunity. It's something that I'm currently working on. But getting that that thing cut down to those top 10 was the first important thing. To, but really what we're doing here is we're measuring the capacity of the system to produce the natural capital necessary for that capital flow model um, to try to get to that known net loss mandate by the, by the regulatory agencies. So here we are in our flow model. This is the world that I'm living in, but I'm cognizant of this flow of capital. Okay, because the flow of capital and the flow of ecosystem process have to blend in this model somehow. Now I gave the same talk to, to a, a room full of economists in ag econ, and they looked at me like, they really gave me one of those looks, like, what are you talking about? Because even though they're natural research economists, they generally treat this part as a black box. All they're concerned about is from here on over. Okay, and they really don't think about this. All they think about is how natural capital engages human capital to make realized goods and benefits of products. Um, but the management of it doesn't get into it. So I said, well, all right, let me, I, I felt the need to turn towards these economics components, which I blatantly don't know that much about. Like I'm trying to figure out how economics drives the sh and shapes landscape. So, back to this paper, the history of, of goods and services. Uh, he said, look, the, the whole of ecosystem services is really under the umbrella of a neoclassic economic paradigm. And neoclassic economics is basically what we all live in. Like, we live and breathe it already. You're all neoclassicist economics students. You have been since you were kids. And you're interested in operating perfect knowledge, like you know where your candy's coming from, and you, want to, and, and you want to maximize your decisions to get the most amount of candy. You've been doing this since you're a child, and you're a rational agent, believe it or not, because you're going to make the best decisions for these things to go in. So this is the assumptions of, of this neoclassical component. Let me read them one more time. So rational agents, whatever those are, operate with perfect knowledge, whatever that is. However, economies are dynamically driven by an, an unanticipated change by policy and whatnot. Rational agents are always trying to optimize decisions to maximize whatever objective they're trying to get at. Now there's other assumptions that we're not going to get into about diminishing returns and equity of sales and purchases and those sort of things. But we're going to focus on the first two. So let's, so let's focus on the first one, the dynamics component. So ecosystems are dynamic, as you know. Same thing with atmospheres. They're driven by disturbance and succession and thresholds and equilibrium or non-equilibrium systems. And ecosystems fluctuate given the fluctuations of disturbance. They have a flux to them. And this is the seizure warning. Sorry, I should fix this slide. But, but because the structural components are fluctuating across time, so the ecosystem functions are also fluctuating across time. And if we add that into our 
rapid assessment model, we should see the ecosystem pulsing in terms of its sink and source products. You guys, if I lost anybody you're with me, you're all with deal with fluxes. You don't know want to talk about it's like a daily business for you guys. Okay, so it fluxes. So the assumption is if ecosystems are fluxing, and they, the sink and source products of these things drive services, then the ecosystem services should also be pulsing. But they're creating capital, which is also pulsing somehow. Okay? Um, so getting this assumption about dynamically driven, how do we how do we capture how do we capture those dynamics? So I this again is the flathead system. This is the North Fork, the Middle Fork, the South Fork, up here in Canada and the United States. Um, my, my focus on a big part of this research is the, is the North Fork and into the main stem to Flathead Lake. So everything above Flathead Lake up into Canada along, the, along that reach, along that section of the river. And what I did to try to capture the dynamics, because rivers are really mobile, they're moving back and forth, they're creating a shifting mosaic. A shifting habitat was that specifically because the trees are knocked down as the river moves this way and young trees are coming up over there and the trees are doing this back and forth and plus logging plus urbanization they're very dynamic systems so I took this I divided the river into a suite of reaches by confluence or geomorphic constraints I added a buffer to it and then and then I developed a very simple rapid assessment tool. Now you have to recognize that by necessity, these things are simple. They're not vortex stretching, okay? They're, they're gonna be really simple. And scientists hate them because they're super simple. But, but regulators hate them because they're really difficult. That looks super hard. So, so the uncomfortable place that the kind of world I live in has to stand between these two places. So let's run through this really quick. What I said is, we can use characteristic plant community. Is it forest or is it not? Or is it shrubs or is it something I would naturally expect or not? What's the diversity of the patches using Simpson's diversity in the seed, which is just kind of a standard plant diversity or uh, species diversity in the seed? And then how fragmented is it by roads and whatnot? And then I said, okay, the buffer is the vegetation, the characteristic vegetation, plus the diversity of the patches, averaged, plus the fragmentation, averaged, is the condition of the buffer in terms of the kind of habitat it can provide. And then I and then I do the same thing for the floodplain, but I average in the buffer into the into the same attributes for the floodplain to get a pretty simple habitat metric. Who did I lose? You lost you. Unfortunately. Okay. It's, only, it's not your fault, though. Just... So let's not start with vortex. We'll start with vortex first. <laughs> it's not that. How, let's, let's get through the slide. Maybe I'll ask you again in a second. So, so I took, you take the, the aerial image to come up with uh, um, reference data. Use the reference data to, to classify the patches in, in, uh, in um, Landsat. And then from the Landsat, I made a perturbation map, which is, is it characteristic plants? Is it, is it not? And then a binary map for the fragmentation. Now this is the part I hope will clear you up. So I take the, the perturbation map and I said if it's unmanaged land, it gets a score of one, right? If it's logging, it gets a score of 0.5. Managed ag, 0.25. Urban gets a score of zero. And that's that same, like the bird analogy I gave, okay? For, for fragmentation, if it's a core, it gets a score of one. Bridges and islands get lesser scores, and managed land gets a score of zero. And then patch diversity measures the, the variety of patches that are in here, and that gets a score between zero and one, too. Then I add, then I put it into this, this thing, and I said zero to one plus zero to one average plus zero to one average again is going to give me some score between zero and one that tells me how good or bad the habitat is based on these simple methods. Then I average that into the book. So obviously these weights have some level of subjectivity to them. So is there any consensus that that's a reasonable weighting? Or like how do you kind of get to those 
other than back to your point that it needs to be simple and it's really just a metric. Oh, that, do I, do I bring you up to speed? I'm good. I'll bring you to speed in a second. So I looked at 37 years of math, tickety top across 37 years. <laughs> and I did it? All right. She challenged me that I had to say that we're taking time in my talk. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, uh, across 37 years, developed 11 classes along this thing, right? Then applied that this this condition score across those across those sites, and our urban sites scored low, our non-urban forested sites scored high, and our logging sites scored in the middle. So, kind of getting towards yours is, did the model reveal? the landscape like we assumed it would. And that's kind of the vetting. It's a lot of best professional judgment, which actually is codified and in the literature. And um, there are more refined ways of getting towards those numbers using a suite of reference data. But at this coarse Landsat scale, the numbers by necessity are coarse. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this kind of, it reveals what I expected it to reveal, but didn't I get it wrong, right? So we've got this wide range of scores with all of these outliers down here. We'll get those up. These outliers all happened after 2010 when Canada changed their logging practices and cranked their logging way up. From 1984 to 2010, they, they didn't have much logging in these sites, and all of a sudden they just they really ramped it up on these sites down here because of some policy changes. So how do I capture all of these dynamics? Because not only, I mean, I don't, I, I keep saying I'm trying to get this to be translatable for management. Like, I don't know if this is possible because they're not going to, most, most folks don't understand box and whisper graphs. They're certainly not going to appreciate this uh, modern portfolio theory approach. But let me talk a little bit about modern portfolio theory, okay? So um, let's say we're going to all go and get an investment call. We're only going to buy tech stocks. We're going to buy Google, Apple, and Microsoft. And we're going to buy 20% Google, 30% Apple, and 50% Microsoft. See, it adds up to one in terms of our weights of our um, assets. Those are assets. Those are the weights of the assets in the portfolio. Okay? But for portfolio doesn't just mean a bunch of things put together. In modern portfolio theory, it's a relationship of the mean return to take the mean of each one of these things over whatever span of time you're looking at. And then you sum it up based on the weights inside of the portfolio to get the return that you would expect if the con previous conditions inform future conditions. Okay? It's a relationship between the, the return and the risk of those things. And risk is measured by the weight of each one of the assets times its variance plus the weight of the interactions of each one of the assets, the standard deviations, and their covariance. And that ends up being a measurement of portfolio risk. And that puts it into this risk return space. And our portfolio is right here, the way it's set up. Now we can go in and we can put 30 different tech stocks on here and do some kind of bootstrapping that applies different weights to that tech stock, meaning that some of them can be zero and some of them can be 100, right, as we go through all of it. And if we ran through all of the different permutations of weights, we could end up with this space of dots. And they generally look like this in this bullet shape. And uh, this outer edge is called an efficiency frontier. So the, the portfolio that we chose is right there. But if we chose this portfolio with different stocks and different weights, we get a higher average return for the same amount of risk. Or we could choose this one and get the same amount of return for much less risk. That's this particular arrangement gave a fellow named Markowitz a Nobel Prize in 1952. And so he came up with this idea of this part of modern portfolio theory. So how does this apply to ecosystem? So in, in following that, these structural ecosystem structures would be considered assets. The relationship of their, them to each other would be considered the weights. How they form the, the, the functions would be a portfolio of these assets. 
and the expected return would be how they respond to condition. And we know that each one of these, these attributes vary over time and co-vary co with each other, which helps us inform the risk component. So finance is worried about asset returns, asset weights, and portfolio risk to come up with these, these analytics. Ecosystems, using this simplified model, the assets are fixed. We can't change assets. But the way my model is written, I'm only, you can't, we can't add more things in to try to jimmy the score. We can't change the weights because the way the model is written, if we change the, we change the weights, we'll change the model, but we can't change the weights over and over again through some bootstrap like that we did with the finance assets. The returns are determined by their condition, the underlying land, land cover types. And then that gives us this range of zero to one, which is a assessment of capacity. And the portfolio risk is, is the covariance and, and variance of those assets. All right, so what does this look like if we apply that? What we get, these, this is Canada, these, these blue ones. The glacier flathead park ones are these green ones. The valley, which is urban and ag, are these orange ones. And it converts this, this arrangement of just sites over assessment scores to assessments to volatility over assessment scores. Sorry, vice versa. But so we can interpret this as the way the model is written. Anything that's relatively stable and high scores up here are natural cover. Relatively very stable but very low scores are anthropogenically hardened simplified systems. And then these, these or heavy logging, which is what these are, or these really dynamic sites is that change in logging from 2010 that lowered the scores in these Canadian sites but ramped up the volatility. So this speaks to ecological simplification uh, because these are hardened, or loss of integrity, which are lower scores but more dynamic, or high integrity metastable systems in the urban areas. But all of these respond to how much, how the fluctuations of the natural capital component, okay? So let's turn to the second assumption. Rational agents uh, make decisions that optimize objectives. So now we're gonna look at this ecosystem structures and we have unmanaged ecosystem structure or managed ecosystem structure. And I'm a rich guy living on the Madison River and I want to enhance my section of river by putting in riprap and putting in logs so trout will hang out there and I can go fishing. So I can do all these managed enhancements to make my in-stream habitat go up so I can increase my service of fishing. But when I do that, I, these unmanaged things don't change, but these managed units will decrease how they interact with floodplain connectivity because I, I made it so the river doesn't overbank. So it creates lots of structure for fish to go in, but doesn't overbank, so it doesn't capture carbon, and it doesn't support downstream ecosystems. So it's detrimental for streams below, for sections below me, but optimized for my own stream. And I don't care about those guys because that's an externality, that's a side effect. So if I'm, if I'm um, uh, Starbucks, and I put in a coffee shop, I don't care about steep and brew, right? Because I don't care what happens to them. Is steep and brew still open? On State Street? Probably closed, but Starbucks, Espresso Royale, closed because of Starbucks. So that's an externality. But externalities don't work in ecosystems because if everybody enhances their, their in-stream habitat and decrease, dis disconnect the floodplain, Everyone fails, including Starbucks. The whole thing fails. No more coffee for anybody. Because externalities don't exist in the ecosystem. They're intertied with one another. So, so the question is, is, are they really rational agents? Um, the rational agents part is, they're hyper-rational. Like, I really am making this best for me, but I'm making it worse for someone else. I'm making it worse for the system. So I'm hyper-rational for my own interests, and I'm hyper irrational for everybody else's interests. Civil cultural practices are the same way. I am very focused on making the most amount of wood. I'm 
don't care about birds and bunnies, right? So they're irrational in terms of managing it holistically. So how do we um, how do we get around to this holistic component? Is is the part we're doing with Manafort is if we have a patch that's managed for for straight logging, so it's enhancing wood for the wood products. And this is for wilderness, so it's not wood products. And this is the land of many uses, Forest Service, which is managed in all sorts of different ways. How do all of these operate in, in a portfolio? And the way to do that is to think about these things as asset classes. So instead of individual assets making up a portfolio, you can use individual smaller portfolios, like I got a bunch of tech stock, and I got a bunch of farm stock, pharma stock, and I got a bunch of metals and you know other things. Each one of those is an asset class. They also vary and covariate with each other. So you can start thinking about how the portfolio looks as a multiple asset classes. So how does portfolio look for carbon storage plus habitat plus water quality plus wood products? And what is the underlying uh, cover types that optimize the most amount of these things? Right. So how do we start to manage them holistically? Does that make sense? You're my, you're not my metric of sense <laughs> making. Okay. So let's take a let's take a one last bit. Start thinking about this this idea that they said that this is based on neoclassic economic theory. Is that really the best the best theory? So all of ecosystem services somehow got taken over by the economists who are managing this thing based on their worldview. But ecosystems have a different suite of of rules that define how they operate. So what is the best way to blend these things? And most of these journals are all from a neoclassic or neoliberal point of view. So there's a lot of great papers on the neoliberalization of ecosystem services with you know, not government regulations involved and the free hand of economics is going to make it all work out, but that's not how ecosystems operate. Right? So we've got this ecosystem service flow model this paper came out by a fellow named Peterson that said the commodification of services obscures ecosystem contribution of natural capital and impedes public understanding of the process. And he suggests a synergy of ecological and economic concepts that benefit both. So his idea is that if we put this thing inside of a black box and only operate from that the flow of capital, then we're obscuring what ecosystems, ecosystems do to produce the capital. And he goes on to um, to write a whole Marxist analysis of it, which was great, because why? I'm an alumni of the University of Wisconsin, right? And the history department is, is uh, at least back in the 80s, was seeped in, in communism and socialism. So I had a lot of communism or Marxism discussions at Stephen Brew, which is not close, apparently. Uh, so, um, but uh, it was fun to read. So, but. And I have an undergrad, I asked an undergrad who's doing an independent study to look closely at these economic theories and interplay with ecologic theories, and then how does Marxism fit into that? And his, his head's exploding, and when he presented it to his advisors and ag econ, he's an econ student, they're like, you can't talk about Marxism, it's not allowed anymore. <laughs> so, um, but, and especially because because ecosystem services is managed from a neoclassic point of view. Neoclassic is the rule. But so how do we engage with this neoclassic economic theory to do the business of science that we do? Okay, that's the real question. And mostly it has to do with this quote right here. The purpose of studying economics is to learn how not to avoid being deceived by economists. Right? Because we do work all day, every day, to try to make the world a better place. But decisions get made in the other room. We've got to communicate somehow in a language that they understand rather than try to make them understand our language. Big lesson. So, any questions from that? Is? All right. Let them have it. Marxist or not. No questions on board check expression. Uh, so, um, so when you're showing the assets for both portfolio, uh, are you just are you just focusing on that domain, or do you care about what's happening outside your the whole suite? Um, if you can go back, like 
Yeah. This, this one? one? Yeah. So you're just focusing on maximizing um, the ecosystem or your object in the domain, but uh, what do you care about what is happening outside of the domain? So this, this figure came from this paper that we put together a couple years ago, which really, the case study that we looked at was this, this uh, mandate called WESCAR, which is a um, carbon sequestration from San Diego to, to Alaska, all along the West Coast, including Canada. So how can they manage the landscapes to maximize carbon sequestration? Carbon sequestration is super important. It's going to save the world from climate change, et cetera. So in their world, um, row crops of cottonwood are super good at carbon sequestration. Now there's another mandate called Yukon to Yellowstone, which is from the Yukon to the Yellowstone, to manage the landscape for megafauna. And megafauna need a different landscape of patches and edges, et cetera, so that they can maximize their habitat and connectivity from Yukon to Yellowstone. The forest the, the forest made to maximize megafauna looks totally different than the forest to maximize carbon sequestration and vice versa. So how do we find a place outside the domain is a good question. We're, we've been challenged to look at the whole continental U.S., you know, but it's broken to regions. But how do we manage forests that optimize habitat and carbon sequestration and civiculture, recognizing that it won't optimize each of them? Right? So it's a holistic approach. And that's just, you know, maybe it's a pipe dream, but at least it's an opportunity to say, here's a way to think about it that everybody benefits from. I don't know if I answered your question, but, yeah. Thank you. What you got? Well, I guess I was wondering where the kind of externalities maybe fit into your flow chart showing the relationship between you know, the, the natural resource, capital derived from it, entering the economic realm, et cetera, and the sort of feedback that that creates. So I was wondering within that flow chart, is there a sense of externality being taken into account, or is that still sort of being ignored? Where did it go? That's such a good one. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Where does externality fit in this? Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a million examples. I'm going to think of one in half a second. It depends on what this service is, okay? So in my list of services, you can see that flood control is more important than carbon sequestration. So already in Washington State, they've already made a decision that flood water control in western Washington, in Seattle, Puget Sound Lowlands, where it rains a lot, that the systems have to be designed to maximize flood control service. That creates the ability to make um, stormwater ponds that hire engineers that reduce conveyance and erosion so it doesn't wipe people's houses out, etc. But that means you have to have open water features with high flux in the in the water storage capacity. But that definitely does not maximize habitat. Especially because when flood control features take on a lot of storm water, they're also bringing in a lot of sediment, which has phosphorus sorb to it. It gets deposited. Trucks got to go in and dig it out. You know, there's still operation and maintenance components involved in it. So they're designed in such a way to maximize storm water control, but the externality in that case would be habitat, right? Or, or even intrinsic value, or some other things that are on that top 10 list. So there, if you maximize, or the best example I can have is actually all the way down here at the bottom. Um, all that. Right there. Um, so this is a, I had this slide in the talk, thought about it. This is a um, sewage treatment wetland that maximizes nutrient cycling, does a great job at nutrient cycling, but it does a crappy job at everything else. So if nutrient cycling is the thing, all wetlands will look like that thing. Well, this, um, 
Sorry. Well, this is a wetland bank to try to get no net loss of function, and that doesn't do as well as nutrient cycling. Right? But this is engineered beyond its natural abilities to do more of it. So there's an example of choices that we make. And that's why I think it's important, even though I don't know much about economics, like I'm waiting on the deep end, you know, I'm like above my head in economics, but it's because decisions are being made that are driven by economics that are, affect how we do our jobs no matter what subject we're choosing. Thank you. Do any of your models account for things like rewilding? Or like, you can't form an earth or earth back in the um, Yeah, well, in an ideal world, you develop a model for the permitting. You say, this is how this thing is operating. Now I'm going to put a Walmart on top of it. Now I've got to account for those in, in terms of compensatory mitigation. I'm going to build a restoration site, and then I'm going to see how that restoration site is, does better and fills that, that compensatory loss. So the rewilding aspect is that, is that gain in function or gain in services over time as, as things become restored. That's essentially what restoration efforts are. I guess I'm still trying to struggle in my head with the conceptual model. Where do you put climate change on top of all of this? Yeah, so uh, climate change is a problem because because what... So wetland, the wetland science has, you have to have uh, inundation and saturation and sufficient duration to support normal, normal circumstances to support a prevalence of vegetation typically adapted to life and hydrogen drug conditions. You're welcome. I have to also be the vice president of the Society of Wetland Scientists, so I have the definition of wetland drilled into my brain right now. But the inundation and saturation at sufficient duration, they say five out of ten years. That's a shifting five out of ten years, right? So you get into extensive droughts, and then the normal changes, and then is it a wetland again, right? So there's real issues and struggle with how do we deal with changing, with global change especially with ideas of references and ideas of does this wetland going to still be a wetland that was constructed for mitigation purposes and compensatory mitigation is it going to survive a changing climate and what does that mean but remember you know as some wetlands go away other wetlands are made because they want more water but then waters of the u.s definition is to get rid of those things <laughs> so it's a mess yep. thank god it keeps me busy keep you guys busy too <laughs> hey. yeah okay, next Dynamic Systems Group at the University of Montana, and uh, to get to using NPP as a surrogate of carbon sequestration, and they use DAYMAT or grid GRIDMAT um, and some other hydrologic or, or meteorologic components to try to get towards how NPP is derived across that 37 years. So there definitely is a depending on whatever thing we're measuring, we're going to have to develop the attributes so we can. You have, you, to, to make those super simple models, you have to do really complicated things, you know? Like that habitat model seems simple, but it took me a few, it took me a very long time to write all the R code to come up with the, with the attributes, you know? So the, hard, the meteorologic models will tie into some of these um, carbon models. So, yes. Yeah. yeah, I think there's movement on this. Right? Yeah. Very yeah. Cool. Bailey's going to solve it all. Forest management and climate model coupling. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's give another hand to Dr. Kendall.